conversation this afternoon. It's great to have everyone with us. Uh, I'm Jamie Schramm. I am going to be the facilitator for the session this afternoon. We have two wonderful speakers who are professionals in the industry who are going to be speaking for us and sharing some information with you. Um, in my role, um, I come from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay Manorwalk campus. I'm the campus executive officer. Great to be collaborating with the Manorwalk Chamber of Commerce and our professionals from the industries. Um, with us this afternoon, we have Jim Irvin, who is a quality insurance and supply chain instructor from Lakeshore Technical College, another great educational institution we have here in our area. And Chris Spencer from Lakeside Foods. He is a senior procurement manager. So whichever one of you would like to go first, um, I'm sure we're gonna hear some great things and be ready to uh, hear some, some great conversation and have some wonderful questions answered towards the end of our session. Gentlemen. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'll go first. I'm just going to pull up my quick presentation here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. So as Jamie said, my name is Chris Spencer. Um, I am the Senior Procurement Manager um, at Lakeside Foods. Um, today in our, our brief our brief time together, I'm gonna go quickly, um, a brief section about myself, a little bit about my background, a little history on Lakeside. Then we're gonna touch on three specific areas of supply chain at Lakeside, um, sourcing, transportation and logistics and replenishment. Again, we'll stay very high level. So any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Um, my very last slide, we, we talk what I call industry specifics, um, specifics kind of tailored more towards transportation and logistics professionals. A little bit about me, like I said, Chris Spencer, Senior Procurement Manager here at Lakeside. Um, I work out of our corporate office, which is in downtown Manitowoc on the south side. Um, my team and my department is responsible specifically for sourcing purchased raw materials, customer artwork redesign transitions, and really all raw material replenishment. I've been with Lakeside a little over a year, I've been in sourcing for 10 years, uh, before my time at Lakeside, I worked for Schreiber Foods up in Green Bay doing private label dairy. I would say that my educational background is probably a little bit unique to, to others maybe in my role. Um, I have a liberal arts bachelor's degrees in history and political science. And you think, okay, history and political science doesn't really mesh maybe with a a supply chain background. Uh, I mean, you know, there are supply chain degrees, there are business degrees. Um, I'll be honest, when I was in uh, high school and college, I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. You know, I had a lot of different interests. I took, did a lot of different internships and jobs, everything from internships in the medical field to internships at historical societies to internships thinking I maybe wanted to get into law. Um, I got to a point in college after taking a lot of my general courses where you said, uh, you know, I really want to study what I like, and then I'm going to figure it out from there. And that's what I did. I really enjoyed history. I really enjoyed political science. And so studying that in college wasn't work for me. Um, it was enjoyable for me. So there are certain things that I learned in studying that as far as how to analyze history, how to think creatively, how to think outside the box that I use every day in my job today. Um, so I'm appreciative of that. About five years ago, I did get my SC Pro certification. Um, that certification is a supply chain certification that really talks about, um, it kind of takes things from end to end. Um, so it's something that I received five years ago. Quickly about Lakeside. Um, Lakeside all began with a man named Albert Landreth. Landreth arrived in Wisconsin in the 1880s to grow seed peas. He recognized that Wisconsin soil produced superior quality peas and he started experimenting with the canning process in a Manitowoc hotel kitchen in 1883. Fast forward a little bit in 1887, the one kitchen operation grew into Wisconsin's first canning plant. The company's first commercial pack at Lakeside Peas was in 1887 and its newly built facility. In 1896, the company name was changed to Albert Landreth Company, staking its future as a canning company and diminishing its role as a seed producer. <clears throat> Flash forward to today. Lakeside is a private label company. So what does private label mean? Um, private label is not specific only to vegetables and fruits and things like that. Private label is, uh, can be seen really in all things from toilet paper to dairy to veggies. Um, 
you know, when you walk into festival or you walk into pick and save or Piggly Wiggly or Walmart, they have their, what we call a store brand. Okay. So festival store brand is essential every day. Pick and save store brand is Kroger, Piggly Wiggly food cup, Walmart, great value. What we do is if you think of a can of corn, we have a can of corn that we produce the corn, but then we put a Kroger label on it and give it to pick and save and they sell it. That is private label. We are labeling for our customer, which is pick and save in their label. As I mentioned, uh, today we're in all major store brands at retail supermarkets throughout the U.S. We have food service, national chain restaurants like Texas Roadhouse or Cisco or U.S. Foods. We added canned baked beans and frozen appetizers and seafood through acquisition, and we added whipped toppings and pet food, pet food through joint ventures. Um, one of the great things about working for Lakeside is the diversification of our portfolio. You know, we're just not a canned veggie supplier or a frozen veggie supplier. Um, as you can see, we have many different avenues and segments to our, our, our portfolio base. We have 13 manufacturing locations. We have 1,000 plus employees, and we currently are number 41 on the largest privately held company in Wisconsin list. We contract directly with farmers in Wisconsin and Minnesota to grow peas, beans, corn, carrot, beets, and potatoes. So outside of what we grow, we also purchase a lot of things that we then repack and sell to our, our customers. So this is just kind of a brief, quick snapshot of what our planting kind of calendar looks like. In February and March, we're planting. The green boxes are when we're actually planting with, um, with our partners, the farmers, and then when we're harvesting. Many of our growers are multi-generational family farmers. We've been working with them for many years. Um, and we, this last year, contracted about 80,000 plus acres of crops under our management. This picture is actually a Michigan carrot field harvesting. So you can um, see it, our fields are right around where we live. When we start talking a little bit more about supply chain, about timing, um, the timing is really tight come harvest season. We're farm to package in less than one day, generally speaking. So that means we really need everything to line up. There are a lot of pieces of the puzzle that have to fall into place perfectly. When you think of getting the crop off the field into trucks, those trucks getting to our plant, our plant being able to receive them in timely and get them to our line and package timely, if any of those pieces are off even just a little bit, it can cause major disruptions to our supply chain and our production um, and ultimately cost money. This is actually a picture of our Manitowoc plant, um, green bean canning. When I look at our supply chain, like I said, we're gonna to touch on three different topics within our supply chain. First being transportation and logistics. We work with approximately 25 different providers. We ship over 25,000 shipments per year, and the vast majority, majority of those are full truckload. Um, we also do ship LTL or less than load, and we also do some rail service. Um, rail, obviously, much more economical as far as pricing goes, um, but not everyone is able to one load and rail or unload rail cars. Um, also, they take a little bit longer lead time or sometimes quite a bit longer lead time, so you have to factor that into your equation. We have a network of over 20 warehouses across the US. And when we're procuring materials or when we're purchasing materials from suppliers, um, we purchase quite a bit outside of the US. Um, when we do that, we generally like to lean on our suppliers to bring those and import those for us. As you can imagine, when you're importing anything to the United States in these um, large containers, there's a lot more, uh, let's just say hoops to jump through, a lot more paperwork to be done. Um, we allow our suppliers to kind of handle that, to take that burden off of our plates if possible. The next area I want to touch on is sourcing. So sourcing, um, like I kind of said, we grow a bunch of things, but we also purchase a bunch of things. So there are just certain things that don't grow well in Wisconsin and Minnesota that we need to sell. Um, so when you think of sourcing, it's really simple. It's just finding the raw material, right? Finding what we need. And not only what we need, but finding what we need from suppliers that meet our requirements, whether that's food safety requirements, um, whether that's um, being part of different program requirements, um, that's what sourcing is. In addition to the actual veggies and fruit, you have to think of all the packaging that we have to source. So 
it's great to have all this fruit um, and all these veggies, but if we can't put it into a can or we can't put it into um, a film or poly to put in frozen veggies, it's kind of useless. So everything from poly and boxes and cans to fruits and veggies we're procuring. The last area I want to briefly touch on in our supply chain is replenishment and inventory management. So before we talked about, um, or I mentioned that can of corn, and when I talk about skews on this slide, that skew, you can have two cans of corn. It's the same exact corn like I mentioned. One is in great value, one is in um, you know, festivals brand. Those are two separate SKUs, right? We manage those SKUs even though they're both corn. So the replenishment team manages right now over 620 different poly or film SKUs for our frozen veggies. They manage over 1,500 canned SKUs. Um, maybe they're not looking at these on a daily ba basis, or each one on a daily basis, but every day they're working with our operation scheduling, with our forecasting to make sure that we have the correct amount of each SKU at the plant so that when operations is running, they can go and grab what they need. Obviously, they don't want to have too little or it will cause inefficiencies for operations. They don't want to have too much because that's just extra inventory and dollars sitting on our shelf. Industry specifics, a little bit closer look at transportation and logistics. So it is a desk job with normal business hours here at Lakeside. I'd say our normal hours are 7 or 7.30 to 4 or 4.30, kind of in that time frame. Um, I would say non-COVID times, um, we do, there are a lot of vendor visits. So you want to go and see in person um, your supplier's operations or bring them into our corporate office and have a sit-down meeting. Obviously, just like we're doing today, there's a lot more virtual going on in these days. Um, I'd say it's a very interesting profession and not only transportation and logistics, but supply chain as a whole. And I think it's interesting because it's constantly changing. There are so many variables and factors in our everyday life that can affect supply chain and transportation, um, such as the economy, government, weather, technology, any foreign issues, that one day you might walk out of the office feeling great about something and unfortunate, an unfortunate thing might happen and you walk in the next day and you have problems to sort through. That's where that critical thinking can really come into play. I'd say generally speaking, a bachelor's degree is a minimum requirement when you get up to the management positions. Um, entry level positions start around $45,000 and I, I'd say there's really no limit to where you can go. I think in all supply chain, dedicated, um, good professionals are always in short supply. That's all I had, any questions? Hey, thank you, Chris. Really good presentation. I'm um, going we'll hold the questions. So after Jim presents, we'll kind of do a Q&A at the end. Sure. But lots of good information. Appreciate learning a little more about Lakeside Foods and about what you do. Jim, would you like no to problem. and share share what, what you do? Yes, I'd be glad to. Thank you. Let me see if I can get my get this opened up. Uh, slideshow. From the beginning. May as well start at the beginning. So my name is Jim Irvin. I have a PhD. Um, I've been around a little bit longer than Chris has, I believe. So I've worked in the food industry for about 40 years, a lot of that in baking. Also made a, a diverse amount of products like stovetop stuffing, oven fry coating mix, hostess cupcakes, a lot of different things. And as I got a little bit further along in my career, I decided that at some point in time, I wanted to go teach school. So I kept going to school and at the age of 63 in 2017, I got my doctorate and I decided that I would stay in the Manitowoc area. I'd been, a, um, I'd been the plant manager at Natural Ovens in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, which is a commercial bakery for the last, hmm, I guess, eight years. And then I decided that I would go teach. We like the Manitowoc area, so I decided just to stay at LTC. So my, my primary courses are supply chain courses. I also teach a lot of different management type courses and things like that. So we talk about supply chain management and Chris talked about it some, we're talking about a very large spectrum, a broad spectrum of information. So from the growers to the consumers, and in some cases there's also a reverse supply chain where for example, you think of the battery in your car and after you use the battery in your car and, and it's exhausted, then you return that battery for a core charge. So it goes back to somebody who tears it apart. So that's part of the reverse supply chain. So there's a lot of different things that happen in the supply chain. There's a lot of different facets to it. 
So we talked about what is supply chain management and, and Chris touched on some of these areas. You, know, you have inventory. And as Chris talked about, inventory is very, very important because if you have too much inventory, you have your dollars tied up in it. If you don't have enough inventory, then you run the risk of shorting the customer. Location, where are you gonna put your warehouses? Where are you gonna put your manufacturing plants? Where are you gonna put your service locations? So there's a lot of that goes into supply chain management. Transportation, transportation, there's, there's a number of different modes of transportation. So you could send stuff by plane, you could send it by ship, you could send it by truck, um, pipeline even. Uh, so there's a lot of different things. Matter of fact, the latest one that I heard was somebody had made drones big enough to take a, a cargo trailer across the ocean. So I want to see how that one's going to work out, but it's something new for the future here. Information. There's an awful lot of information that flows in supply chain and it flows from the suppliers to the manufacturer, to the customer, and the customer back to the manufacturer, to the supplier. So it's a multi-directional information chain. Production. You know, supply chain isn't just products, there's also services, but normally when people think of supply chain, they think of products instead of the service. So where are you gonna do production? How much are you gonna do? Someone has to be responsible for deciding what you're gonna make when. So I've been working with some of the local cheese manufacturers and, and some of the cheeses are out several years. So they have to decide years in advance what variety of cheese someone's gonna, gonna wanna buy several years from now. And then supply, how much supply do you want? That ties into inventory. Where do you put the supply? How do you keep track of it? A lot of different parts of supply chain management. So what types of titles are there in supply chain management? Well, you can see a list of them here and they, they work with logistics analyst, management analyst, production clerk, shipping clerk. There's also purchasers, schedulers, planners. There's a lot of different titles that go into the supply chain and everyone's, everyone's job is very important in it. So how do we prepare you for supply chain? So I'm gonna talk from Lakeshore Technical College perspective. You know, and different people come about it differently. Some of them based on experience, some of them based on degrees. But when we try and prepare you for a supply chain management degree, we have a number of different classes that are very specific, core classes that are very specific to supply chain. So if we look at purchasing, supply chain management, global supply chain management, global supply chain management is, is interesting and Chris touched on it, but the world has shrunk so much, not, not literally, but figuratively, because of the speed of transportation, the technology, that even very small companies, that we think of very small companies in our local area are dealing internationally, you know, and they're, they're part of the global supply chain. Um, enterprise resource planning is a class where we teach you how much you're gonna produce at a factory, how you're gonna get it to your sales areas. Do you ever use a big truck? Do you use a little truck? Do you make it full? There, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Computer simulation for operations management is a, is a newer class. We're trying to keep up with technology. A lot of companies use computer simulation to try and decide what's going to happen in a given environment without actually having to go through the cost and expense and risk of doing it. So they do it on the computer. So you can see that there's a lot of different classes, some ISO classes, some lean classes. So we prepare people to think along the lean line of manufacturing, the lean line, because your supply chain is your business. Your business needs to make money. You know, the basic tenet of business is to make enough money to come back to work the next day. So you have to get lean in order to compete with everybody else. There's also a supply chain assistant, which is a technical diploma. So some of my students have opted for the technical diploma. They get that first, get in the supply chain, get a job, start working and return or continue on for the associate's degree. So you can see that the, the technical diploma, the supply chain assistant is a narrowed down version that only takes one year, it's 30 credits, well, one year full-time, 30 credits, but it concentrates on, on those classes that are very specific to supply chain. Benefits of supply chain manager positions, and Chris touched on some of them. You know, he talked about, for one thing, some of the students that I've had when I've asked them why they're in supply chain or why they want to get into supply chain, some of them would answer, I've been out on the floor working. I don't like it on the floor. I would rather work in an office. Okay, that's one of the benefits of a supply chain manager position. So the Association for Supply Chain Management in 2020 surveyed 2,400 supply chain professionals. And as, as a whole, they talked about high salaries and good benefits. And we're gonna get into that in a little bit more detail. And, and Chris mentioned about the $45,000 um, fulfillment. As you're looking for a job, especially the audience that are high school students now, as you're looking for a job, 
Don't just be attracted to the money. That's normally what people want to go for. But think about your job fulfillment. If you're in a job that you hate, you're not going to be happy. It's going to be tough to go to work every day. Advancements for opportunity or opportunity for advancements, I mean. You know, there's, there's people who get in a job and they stay in that job. We call them cornerstone people. And I really very much appreciate them because we really need them. They bring a lot of continuity. But most people get a job and they look at what their advancement opportunity is. And in the supply chain, because of the variety of different jobs that there are, there's a lot of different opportunities for advancement. Variety of work. Chris said, you don't know what you're going to be doing from one day to the next. I mean, you may have your day planned out. But all of a sudden, the president decides that he's going to put an extra tariff on cheese coming in from Italy. So now your sales in cheese skyrocket because the supply from Italy shrunk because there's an extra 14% tariff comes in. An overwhelming majority, 88% of the people who responded to this particular survey um, have a positive outlook on their careers. 85% say that they'd recommend working in the supply chain to those and others. And everybody I talk to has the same, has the same thought process. How much can I make? That's always a big question. People want to know how much they can make. You know, if you look at the job stability, for one thing, if your goal in life 15 years ago was to be a manager of a blockbuster video, you kind of limited yourself. Supply chain, no. So salaries are solid. So supply chain professionals with a bachelor's degree reported a median salary, so an average salary of $78,750. So that's 24% higher than the national median salary. So that means that people in the supply chain are making more money on an average in comparison to uh, the rest of the rest of people in the United States. Those with an associate degree reported a median salary of 60 some thousand dollars, which is also much higher than the national median salary. So it's a good investment. You know, if you're if you're taking a two year investment at Lakeshore Technical College to get an associate's degree, there's a good return on it. And the bachelor's degree is even better. And as Chris said, if you want to get into a management position, you're probably going to need the bachelor's degree. There's some people that get in with a combination of education and experience, but you're much better off if you continue for the bachelor's degree. And there's opportunities to finish a bachelor's degree in supply chain in the local area. Uh, UWGB has it. Um, Lakeland College has it. Benefits are good. So we talked about don't just fall for the pay. You know, you want some fulfillment. You want some some uh, something that's gonna make you happy in your job and also look at benefits. So kind of a historical thing. Back in the 1980s, I worked for General Foods. General Foods was a very, very generous company. So when we figured out what the cost per hour was with benefits, we normally figured what their pay was and about 25% extra. You know, and that seemed to be a good dollar amount. Today, because benefits have gone up so much, Benefits are sometimes more than 100% of your pay. So if you make $10 an hour, you and the company combined paying for benefits are paying more than $10 an hour in addition to that to get your life insurance, health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So look at your benefits when you go for a job. And, and luckily, in supply chain professionals, they've been offered paid family medical leave. A lot of places it's unpaid. More than 80% receive three weeks of vacation time. I've actually worked at jobs where I had to work an entire year to earn one week's vacation. So if you get a job where you're getting three weeks of, of vacation time, that's great. So look at your benefits too. Any bonuses? Well, bonuses are, are additional earnings, the opportunity for it. So 91% of the people who responded out of that 2,400 that, that answered the survey responded that they get some form of additional cash compensation, whether it's bonus or profit sharing. And the average increase received, so the average raise is 4.7%. You know, cost of living, the CPI is about 1.3%, so 4.7. And a lot of places, because of the economy, are only giving the cost of living increase of 1.3%. So to get a 4.7% raise is great. Gender gap. So there's a lot of discussion about um, equity and pay, equity and pay amongst genders. So when we look at the supply chain for the second year in a row, respondents under 30, so if, if, this, if the audience for this is the high school, then you're certainly the under 30, reported the same median salary regardless of gender. So whether you identify as male or you identify as female, you still get the same salary. Women 30 to 39, so the next age group up, report a median salary that's 93% of what men were paid. You know, you'd still like to see it at 100%, there should be parity, but those who identify as, as female, 
get 93% of what the men get, and that's much higher than the 82% as a, as a national average in other, other businesses. So is the job gonna continue? Are there gonna be supply chain jobs in the future? You betcha. If you look at all US jobs, the growth rate between 2008 and 2017 was 5% for all US jobs. And that includes the transportation logistics sector, the supply chain sector, which had 13%, more than two and a half times the growth rate of all the US jobs put together. There's a lot of opportunities and, and where do you wanna live? You know, that's another consideration. So I've lived in eight different states and worked in eight different states. So I've kind of picked across the map and lived out west and lived down south. But you can look at this map and you can say, you're not stuck in one particular area. You know, if you were an oceanographer, chances are pretty good you'd be close to the water. So you're kind of limited where you can be. A supply chain, you can live wherever you want to in the United States. Has COVID affected the supply chain jobs? Every day on the news, you hear all about it. So this was from... Yesterday or the day before, right now, humankind is witnessing the greatest vaccination effort in history. More than 15.9 million doses in 37 countries have been delivered thus far. But that's not anywhere close to what it needs to be. And, and the big problem is the supply chain. You know, Pfizer came out with the, with the first vaccine that was approved, but it has to be kept at a sub-zero temperature. So how do you ship something that has to be kept at a sub-zero temperature and in this case, you have to guarantee that it did not have temperature abuse and go over that temperature because it could be a dead virus by the time somebody gets it. So you have to make sure that it's there. That's the supply chain manager's job. Somebody has to figure out where this, this medicine is going to go to. So if you're only producing 10% of the vaccine that you need for the country, who's deciding where it's going to? It's the supply chain person does that. You know, so yes, COVID's affected the supply chain in great detail. COVID-19 pandemic has put supply chain in the spotlight and people now realize the crucial role it plays in maintaining the flow of goods and services. And, and it does. You know, if it was not for the supply chain, the vaccines would go nowhere, you know, and they would sit at the manufacturer and nobody would ever get vaccinated. Prior to COVID-19, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated the demand for supply chain professionals exceeded supply by a ratio of, I think it's six to one. Could you imagine that, that you go looking for a job and instead of having to compete with other people, there's six other companies, five other companies offering you a job at the same time. So there's a lot of jobs available. As workforce is reshaped by the pandemic, the need for supply chain professionals will only continue to grow. Yeah, and, and we've only hit, hit the tip of getting the vaccines out, getting the vaccinations done. So it's not just shipping the vaccines, it's also giving the vaccinations. So you have to line up the supply chain for that. So I went online two days ago and, and I looked at some recent job postings. So these are over $69,000 for pay. So I just picked two of them locally and two of them across the nation. So you see St. Nazians and, and Manitowoc, both have jobs that pay over $69,000 for a supply chain person. If you wanna look internationally, or nationally I mean, you'll get Irving, Texas. There's $85,000 base salary plus bonus. There's a job in Minnesota. You can go on indeed.com and you'll see hundreds of jobs, literally hundreds of jobs that supply chain offers up. So, so there's a lot of different opportunities, both locally and outside of the local area. So when you're thinking about your choices, here I get my plug in for LTC. When you're thinking about your choices, thinking about going to a local college, Lakeshore, we have the supply chain program. You know, we'd be glad to see you walk across the stage, get your hand shook when you get your diploma. Um, so does anybody have any questions? They have anything they'd like to ask? And, and I'll defer that back to Jamie so he can ask the questions. Yeah, thank you both of you for your uh, sharing your knowledge and in, in, in input and your experience and wisdom. It's much appreciated. Some great stuff. So are there any questions um, in the chat that anyone would like to put in there? Do you have any questions coming forward? Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll ask one. So you mentioned, uh, I think Chris, you mentioned a, a less than load. So obviously that's very inefficient, very expensive to ship a trailer with less than a full load. So either one of you, based on your experience, what would require that? Why would you make that decision to do something that's less than optimal? 
Well, the main reason you would look to do it is probably because um, if you brought in more than that, you're probably likely look, sitting on a whole bunch of inventory. So whenever you're looking at LTL shipments, you're, you're, if you only need a half a truck, in an ideal world, you can maybe stop somewhere near and pick up another half truck. Now, there are a lot of things that um, have different temperature requirements and things like that when they're on the truck. Um, so it's not as easy as just going, I have a half truck, what do you want to put on it type of thing. We also have different um, quality assurance regulations and food safety regulations that say that um, only X, Y, and Z can ride on our trucks and there is, there's different seal tags. So it's a lot more complicated than just getting it on the truck, but long story short, the main thing is if I brought in a full truck of it, maybe for this specific item, it'd be three or four years worth of supply and we just don't want to have that much money on our shelf. Okay. Here's a real life uh, worst case LTL is I had a machine that went down. It was a brand new machine. It was actually more a prototype than, than in service and uh, it broke down. So I had to call the manufacturer and tell them what I needed. And the situation to me anyway, was so critical that they ended up renting a plane and flying it there. So all that was on there was one piece of plastic that was about three inches deep and about 12 inches long. And they rented an entire jet and flew it over there for $7,500. LTL, sometimes it's because someone's made a mistake, something's gone wrong and they need to correct it. Absolutely, well, thank you for sharing that. And that it's good to hear some you know, real life stories. I heard both of you mentioned like lean and lean principles and, and integrating that. How important is it to understand what that is and what that means in your role and how much of that, how, how much of that do you apply um, when you're working professional out in the supply chain and logistics field? Well, we teach lean because every company and every person that works for a company has an obligation to try and reduce costs. You know, you're in such competition and because of the technology changes and, and how small the world seems now, your competitors are not just the people in the same town anymore. They're not the same people in the same state. You have worldwide competition. So you have to do things better, faster, smarter, cheaper, stronger. So lean becomes a part of that. And you have to keep paring away costs. You know, what can we do to make this run better? What can we do to have less mistakes? What can we do to have less inventory where it's not needed? So you need to keep concentrating on lean and that's why we offer it. And, it, and if you get the associates degree from LTC, you're only about, I think, two classes away from getting a black belt in lean also. Yeah, I agree with everything Jim said. And, um, you know, one thing that we preach within Lakeside is lean is a, it's not a one day event. You know, this is an ongoing lean journey that we're on and um, you do one thing and that doesn't mean you stop. Then you look for the next thing. You look for the next thing. Because Jim said, your competitors are doing that. And you can only drive down, the, let's just say I'm buying corn, the cost of corn to a certain dollars per pound. But there are a lot of um, accessorial charges and other charges that come along with it that you have to pair away with. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an ongoing journey. Very nice. Thank you. So uh, what I'm hearing you both say is it's, it's a journey of continuous improvement. And you're not necessarily making it cheaper by reducing the quality, but what you're doing is you're taking out wasteful operations. I heard Jim take, take off a whole bunch of different things and you're really trying to reduce wasteful things that don't add any value for your consumers. Um, so both of you obviously have some really good experience. What would be the one or two top skill sets that you would tell high school students they should be developing to be successful in roles like yours? No matter which field you go into, you need to have communication skills. And one of the things that I find in classes, when I took classes, when I taught classes, is students do not like to talk in front of the group. But you have to learn to do that. So you have to develop your communication skills. And the better you get at it, the higher you will go. You know, there, there's very few people that become CEO that don't like to talk. You know, sometimes some of them like to hear themselves talk too much, but you have to have communication skills. So I would say that that's the number one skill set, no matter what field you're going into. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, Jim. So I'll take another one. <laughs> uh, I think that communication, but I also think um, that drive to think critically about different things. You can't just take the easy way. Uh, maybe the thing that looks black and black and white, because it's the easiest. Um, you have to you have to put the time and the effort in to think of 
how can I do this better? Right. And maybe it's not the right way. And maybe there's a lot of times that you fail before you succeed, but you have to have that persistence and that, that drive to think critically and come up with a better solution. Hey, I really appreciate those answers. So one follow-up question, and I'll give each of you a chance maybe to, to just share some, some closing thoughts. So Jim mentioned communication uh, up front and maybe, you know, his longevity in the field, he'll have a little bit more insight on this, but Chris, I'm guessing you've seen it too. How has communication changed since you've been in the field of how you communicate and, and what is it like and what are some challenges maybe that our e-world or electronic world brings, brings forth? Well, I guess the old guy will go first. So obviously for me, it's changed considerably. You know, I still remember when I was at General Food, so this was back in the 1980s, that we used to have these pads of paper and at the top it would say AVO. And AVO meant avoid verbal orders. So it was like four parts and you filled it out and you gave one part to somebody else, you gave another part to somebody else, you kept a part. You hardly ever see pieces, well, you see pieces of paper anymore, but I've had people that would not accept pieces of paper. Everything had to be electronic. And I certainly think that that's where we're moving towards. Um, we now sign contracts without ever seeing the people. Everything's done electronically. You know, the world continues to move forward that way. And I, and I think it's a good move. You know, I think that we're saving some of our natural resources for one thing, but for the other thing that I, I think that we're able to communicate a lot more quickly and a lot more effectively. So my younger brother does drug research and he works with people all over the world. And for him to be available to him at all times of the day and night would be ridiculous because some of them are 13 hours time difference, eight hours time difference. But because of electronic media, he's able to keep in touch with them anytime. You sit there, you watch TV, a commercial comes on, you check your phone for emails, which, which is what I do all the time. And you can respond to it at any time of the day or night. It's not like you have to be in your office waiting for a paper to show up, to open the paper and read it, and then try and file it and respond. So there's been an awful lot of changes in communication just based on the technology changes. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I'll just add one of the main, um, the main things that I really stress when we get new people on our team is um, feel free to pick, please pick up the phone and call someone right? So much. It's so easy to send an email um, nowadays or just uh, do it that way that we kind of lose the, the sense of even just picking up the call, not, not even meeting in person anymore, but just talking to someone. It's so text message and email. And yes, those, are, those have their place and are very valuable, but I would just really stress what you can accomplish in a 30 second phone call might take you 30 minutes back and forth via email to get done. So in my eyes, um, I would always start with a phone call. And if you have to file open email after, that's fine. But I always push that. Well, I want to thank, thank both of you again for sharing your, your knowledge and wisdom and give you an opportunity here. We're a little bit past time. I think we were planning for about 30 minutes. But um, final pieces of advice for young people thinking of, you know, what their career choices are going to be and perhaps thinking of a career choice uh, and following a similar path to either one of you. What would be your, your parting bits of wisdom for them? Well, my advice would be, continue to get your education, whether it's a formal education or an informal education. You know, you're, you're competing with everyone else out there for jobs, for wealth, for whatever, whatever you can think of, there's competition. And, and the way to be better than the competition is to make sure that you're prepared for it. And the way to be prepared for it is to continue your, your education. And, and although, of course, I, I want everyone to go to LTC, you can go anywhere and you can also learn things through online learning. A lot of companies offer very good training programs. Take advantage of them. And, and don't do like I did and wait until you're 63 to finish your college degree. Go ahead and finish it up early. You won't have to worry about it then later. I, I think my one piece would be um, to always, always push yourself, right? It's easy to get complacent. It's easy to feel like, yeah, this is good enough. And that's one of the great things about supply chain, like Jim mentioned in his thing, there's so many different avenues you can take under the umbrella of supply chain, but get those experiences, whether that's part-time jobs or whether that's paid or unpaid internships, get experiences everywhere and um, something will click for you. And all of a sudden it will click and you'll investigate it more. And like I kind of said in my presentation, I studied history and political science because I knew I enjoyed studying it. It wasn't work for me to do it. I didn't know where it would take me, but I only knew by trying different, different things, different internships, different experiences. So seek out those experiences. 
Hey, so some great final words again, Jim, Chris, thank you very much. Um, your experience, not only in the field, but I think those great words of wisdom for our students, our local students in the area are, are pretty amazing. So students, there you have it, right? Logistics, supply chain, and some life wisdom on how you should approach school and career choices and uh, go after those experiences and keep, keep trying new things. Certainly thank you uh, for participating everyone and students, thank you for taking time to watch us and certainly wanna thank uh, the Manorock Chamber of Commerce and, and some of their community partners for helping to organize this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.